Thank you, Gary. And good day, everyone. I'm happy to be on this beautiful ship again. And uh, I, uh, I am a little uh, jet lag, but uh, when you're on a ship, uh, that's the best cure for jet lag, I suppose. And I imagine most of you already been to France, uh, so this is uh, perhaps a, a few things that you haven't heard about this great country. I, I uh, as a, as a child in, uh, in the U.S. back when I went to high school, we had to learn French which we thought was a romantic uh, option compared to German, something like that. So I've, I've over the different years, I've uh, come to France many times, either in the ports or else working on projects. And I'm also here with my wife, Barbara. I'm going to say hello to her. She had also studied at the International School of Puppetry of the Marionettes in Charleville. And so we've both been to fr uh, France in different places. But uh, if you've been to, to one part of France, you realize that there's a lot more to it. And one of the uh, curious uh, phrases I heard from a French friend, why travel around the world when we have everything in France? The history, the food, the beaches, the mountains. And so, uh, curiously, France sends fewer tourists out than come to France, like ourselves. Uh, and so it's a great experience. I'm just going to give you an introduction to um, this part of France. Um, of course, our schedule is pretty quick because we have all of tomorrow we're in Enfleur, which is the access to Paris, and then we go to the Channel Islands, and then to Saint-Malo, and then after that we have a sea day that goes around uh, Brittany, and we go down to Bordeaux. And so I'll just um, give you a taste of so this, of course, is the great uh, uh, Mont Saint-Michel near Saint-Malo, which is one of the icons of France. Now, but we are, of course, in Dover, and you can, you look out your sweet window, you can see France. And it's getting closer every year, they say. Um, and then we'll be going down the uh, coast and around to, this is Cherbourg around here, but Enfleur is, is right here. And that's uh, also La Havre and the access on the Seine River. So those of you who arrived via London, uh, that was quite a traffic jam, wasn't it? I really enjoyed my nap during it. We came down to uh, Dover, which of course has nearby the channel, and then you saw those lines of trucks, and then you may have been following the troubles of all the immigrants who have been trying to get through the channel, jumping the train tracks and the trucks and all that. So that is right near where we are, but we're not going to Calais. We're going to go all the way down to um, what is Enfleur, which is on the south bank of the Seine near Lavre, which is the major port for this part of France. I'm going to be talking a bit about the, what you say here, it says Le, Le Manche. That's the French term for what we in uh, English called the English Channel, but really it's a French Channel. But they call it the sleeve. That literally means the sleeve of the sea that connects the North Sea to the rest of the Atlantic. And uh, we'll be in the Bay, Bay de Seine. Of course, we can go to Rouen, uh, Rouen or to Paris all the way on excursion, but it's a bit of a trip. That's why we're there overnight, so we can have a full trip to Paris if that's what we want to do. Otherwise, there are a lot of little villages and a lot of beautiful little places all along this coast. Uh, you see that cup, uh, Grinet, that means the gray nose, which is near Calais. We have a friend who's a painter who only paints that cape, beautiful extended cliffs out into the sea. So this whole stretch of the English Channel on both sides is very dramatic, rocky, lots of cliffs. You saw the white cliffs of Dover as you got, came onto the ship, or we'll see it as we leave here. And then again, uh, Cherbourg, which used to be a uh, major port for ocean liners. Occasionally, they still stop there. The Channel Islands, or as in French, they call Ile anglo Normand. Now, this whole part of France is called Normandy. I'll go into that. Then there's uh, Bretagne, Brittany. Um, and there's a lot of similarities across the Channel to England in the, in the geology and the topography of it. But what you have in this channel, uh, the English Channel, is the world's busiest sea passage other than at Singapore. So you have the straits that have constant traffic, and it's really quite hazardous. You get very big waves, uh, strong tides, bad weather, fog, uh, winter storms. Uh, but right now, of course, it's very pleasant, and you can see all the way across it. But this is all monitored by French and English authorities, to, almost like an airport. They have to line them up and schedule them through for the bigger ships to get through without running down all the little craft. Well, anyway, in, in, in history, uh, going back to geology, this was all uh, land before the sea started rising about 15,000 years ago. And actually, England 
uh, isles used to be connected to France, and there's similar chalk formations from Dover over to Calais. But what this map is is actually a, a linguistic heritage, being that what we know as English is an amalgam of um, Norwegian, German, French. And the red, of course, is the Scandinavian Norwegian languages, which then were spread, you see, all through northern uh, Scotland, now all the way down to the, the uh, Midlands places. There were Viking settlements all through, including down to Normandy. The name Normandy means the Norse, because in the 17, I'm sorry, the 724, they first attacked in from Norway to Lindisfarne in England. And by the 800s, they were attacking along the French coast. And then they settled in what is now Normandy. Um, the other colors, the buff there, that's actually, uh, of course, Danish, which in the Denmark region or the area of England, um, when the Danes t took it over, they were in conflict with the Norwegians. So this is just a sketch of the kind of complicated ling linguistic history of, of um, both Normandy and, and, and England. So the green, though, that's Norman being the predecessor to modern English in the sense that they brought all of the French words into what was the Anglo-Saxon uh, language in the mixed Norse heritage. In the, 18, in, the, in the 800s, the Vikings started coming up the Seine and they raided smaller towns. They could never quite capture Paris, but they ravaged the coast as they were doing all around, all the way down to the Mediterranean. So here's an illustration of them, rather elaborate looking vessels coming up the uh, Seine to lay siege to Paris in 885. And um, the first Norwegian was from Olesen. His name was Rollo of Olesen, but his subsequent forebears kept attacking the French, including laying siege to the Ile de Cité, back when the center of Paris was a great fortress. Now it's, of course, the Notre Dame and the bridges and all what we know today. But here, here was the siege, which was not successful, but uh, Charles the Bald, the French king at the time, made a deal that he would give the, the Norsemen a piece of the coast so they would stop coming up the river and ravaging central France. So that became Normandy. And then the uh, Normans, or the essentially Nor Norwegians, adopted French customs and French language. But to this day, all through this part of France, it's still mixed with the remnant of Norse. And then that, of course, with William the Conqueror, uh, went over to England and then became what became the, the modern English. But here's the famous Beirut um, tapestry uh, with the Viking ships, essentially, but they were now Normans, and uh, William the Conqueror was the king of Nor Norman. And uh, that's still the, the name of the province to this day. Anyway, just in the detail, you can see the beautiful stitchery, in the, but it, what's of interest is it's very well defined on how they built their ships. Uh, putting in caulking in a kind of clinker style construction. And then uh, originally uh, in the Middle Ages and after the Norman conquest, the l court language of, of England was French and all of the ordinary people spoke Anglo-Saxon, which then was merged and became what we know today as English. So um, th this is where this area in, in you know, centuries of conflict is actually uh, quite an amalgam of cultures. Then, of course, the English Channel became the great protector of England from uh, not only Napoleon, but then World War II, World War I. This is actually a map of the outlying radar zones and flight interception zones during World War II and the Blitz. But you can see that the French coast was absolutely strategic to keep, uh, well, have the Germans occupied all this area, but they couldn't land in England. There was the air war. But the remnants of it can be seen today. If you go out on one of the excursions along the coast, you'll still see these great camp shore batteries. And then um, structures like this were for spotting. Uh, this is actually a German-built spotting tower up near Cherbourg. Uh, and some of them now have been uh, converted into summer homes, though. They, I don't think the cannons are included anymore. Well, just uh, now that we're in peace and prosperity and all that old history is uh, hopefully uh, never coming back, here's the kind of thing they're building in Portsmouth, uh, England. So as a welcoming sign to people come into the great center of the Royal Navy. Now, we're not going there, but that's just an example of the modern architecture you'll see next to all of these beautiful uh, historic buildings here. Well, you know that France is uh, you know, a large country um, with all these departements, they call it regions, all centrally uh, 
led from Paris. So Paris is both the economic capital and the political capital of the country. And, I, and when I was in university, I read a political scientist who complained that the problem of the world is that some countries are too big to behave properly. At that time, Soviet Union, United States, uh, China, they were just too big to manage internally, and then they were uh, causing trouble around the world, and the, the way to run the world is have no country bigger than France. Of course, this was a French writer. <laughs> and of course, there are all these departements in the Caribbean, Polynesia, so the remnant of, remnants of the French Empire are still out there, but they're mostly, um, you know, they, what they call Outremer, the overseas uh, um, territories where they have full French rights and citizenship. Well, anyway, we are going up only to here. Now, Honfleur and the Seine is right here up in the upper right-hand uh, corner. And then this is Cherbourg Peninsula, and then Saint-Malo is down in the Bight of uh, Britannia. Uh, but we will sail around that. Here is Le Havre, the larger city. We are going to Honfleur, which is a smaller port that had been a medieval port, but then it, the Seine River silted up. And so it was not an active port until fairly recently that they built large container dockage so that we can go there and go to Paris and around the countryside. But Honfleur itself has its own crest. It was a fortified wall city, like most of these are, uh, those who still have their walls. And for centuries, you can read the details, there were battles between the English and the French over the control of the ports of the channel. And famously, Honfleur and Saint-Malo would attack over what they call the Saint-Port, Saint where the five royal open ports of medieval England were right across the channel, including Dover. The flag outside on the, uh, on, uh, outside on the terminal here is one of the flags of the, of the five ports that were open at the time. But there was a lot of piracy, a lot of smuggling, and so this is a lot of, uh, many a tale. But you, know, you go to, on your excursions, you just walk around these towns, you can almost feel the flavor of those old times, very salty, very uh, fishy maybe. There's still some fish. Um, but the, the architecture is um, stone, uh, sturdy, meant for the winter storms, um, and then the commerce that would come in. Uh, so this is, some of it's new, some of it's older, but there's some very well-preserved medieval villages in the area. Unfortunately, most of these ports were heavily bombed during World War II in the troubles of that time, and they have been built back, some of the historic monuments. Even the wall cities have been reconstructed in places. This is just en fleur where uh, the famous composer Eric Satie lived, one of the local heroes of music and about 150 years ago, if you know it. Here is a, a typical Enfleur style Seine area um, cottage, which it has incredible gables. But when I looked at this, I said, well, this is actually looks a lot like uh, Scandinavian architecture, which you see the elements. It's not, uh, uh, let's say, Gothic or simple farmhouse. The wooden construction is quite elaborate, which was a feature of Scandinavians. Here's the Église Saint-Catherine, which again looks almost like a stave church, if you've seen the traditional churches up in Norway. So this is the heritage I'm just trying to show you. Now I'm going to go on to the Channel Islands, which are a, a, U, a, a United Kingdom members, but they have their own independent gov government, and they are in a, a, a they, for, historically they've always been contested between the various French, the various English, uh, then they were all occupied by the Germans, and so they've had a, uh, the, the blessing of being offshore, but then they've always had a certain defense they had to have. We are going to St. Peter Port. There are all these other islands, and there's uh, Alderney, and then there's Jersey, the largest one, just south off the map here. We won't go there, but uh, some of them are privately owned. Like Sark is owned by its own, um, there's a guy who's declared himself the Earl of Sark. Now, if you have enough money, you can buy an island almost anywhere in the world, but these are Particularly nice, but in the summertime. Now, the names of this uh, uh, Guernsey is actually, again, Norse. The E-Y means island, and Gern is uh, a, a word that says fields. So there's a lot of fields on the island, and I'll, I'll just show you a bit of it. It has all these variegated uh, scallop beaches that are beautiful, and then lots of rocks all over the place. So navigation is very tricky in these islands. You always had to have a local pilot to get through them. And then upland there are these fields and there's no more forest. These have been occupied by people since 
prehistory, including the Celts, the Romans, and everybody else that's come through. This is the seal of Guernsey, which is the uh, symbol of King Richard of England. And so they are both English, but they also speak French, and they have their own uh, Guernese, they call it, which is their own Channel Island mixture that still has, again, remnant Norse words. Here's the Cornet Castle, which has been uh, occupied and attacked many, many times. I won't go through all the history because there's just so much of it. But uh, this is what we'll see when we come into harbor. Oh, no, they built a dock just for us. But it's very dangerous, and I know because I have a boat from that area. But upland, you see these beautiful fields. The, the, the soil is very rich, and so other than the fishing, then there's the uh, favorite cows of Guernsey and Jersey. Now, these are curious because they had been brought from the continent, and then they developed their own breed, but because of the milder climate and the different kind of a grass, they are famous for their good, rich buttermilk and have been exported around the world. So if, if you have room in your suite, you can get one and just keep it quiet till you get off the ship. <laughs> oh, they're lovely. Makes you, makes you want to have a milkshake. Well, in the, the, the medieval towns are walking pleasure. This is Port, Port Saint, uh, Saint Peter Port. And they're not big. In, a, in a, a half a day, you can walk all around the town with various Victorian buildings and towers. This is the Victoria Tower. Uh, but uh, it's, again, very British, except uh, note that all of the uh, phone booths and even the um, mailboxes are not red, they're blue. And that's sort of a sign of the Channel Islands want to do it a little different. And, of course, they, they only have a population of about 60,000 in all the islands, but a lot of visitors in the summer. Uh, Jersey is the, the larger of the islands, and this is an example of how nautical they are. They sail around the world, have stamps of China and all these other places where the sailors from this part of the world are, well, famous for going all over the world. Now, this is Jersey Harbor that when you come into it, and you can see that the tide is quite fantastic. There's 10 to 15 foot tide, so you have to be careful when you're coming and going, especially for all those, those rocks floating out in the outer harbor. Um, we're not going to Jersey. There is a ferry service between them, but this is the largest of the island uh, towns called saint Helier. And um, again, the symbol of the three lions. Um, Jersey. Now, anybody been to Jersey? How about New Jersey? Oh, right. Now, that's a... See, most people in New Jersey don't even know where the name comes from. They don't realize that it's a Norse name. And actually, Jer is uh, originally Jarl, which means the Earl of the island. And then there's another town in uh, northern England called York, which means the Earl of the Bay. It was Jarvik, became York, which then became the, uh, the name of the vill fishing village I live in, New York. Well, here's one of the fortresses of, again, Norman times with the little harbor. You can see all the mud flats that uh, kind of ground both. They have a particular kind of sailboat in this area where they have fins that sit out so the boat will sit in the mud. And then tide rises and go again. Here's one of the oldest churches, L'Hermitage in saint Helier, which was a, a nunnery. And then their modern or Victorian buildings. This is a, the Elizabeth College. And then a lot of shore uh, ho holiday houses and uh, villages all through the island. But there's no, there's no real deep interior. There's, again, there are more cattle and gardening in the higher uh, parts of the island. But here's an example of the uh, Channel Islands sort of mixed language. C'est le bienvenu à Jerry. Jerry is the local lang name for Jersey, so I think it's near uh, uh, Hoboken, actually. But more the language, they always have both French and English because they are right in the middle of both these countries. And of course, uh, uh, the kids that grow up there, they are, go, often they go to university in uh, Britain. Um, because it's such a small town. But this is their Fête de la Mer, which is the ocean festival they have every year. More names that you don't see. This is Neth as in Netherland. That's again a Norse word, the, the back road. That's what that means. And here's even the BBC has gotten into it to teach Gernesis, however they pronounce it. We'll find out when we get there. So it's a, sort of a one of these local regional languages typical in France and even in England that uh, only the locals know enough to speak it. There's less than 10% of the population speak it all day long, though. But otherwise, on the beaches and in the harbors, there's a lot of people who come for holidays. So this is a famous Renoir 
painting in 1883 of the, the girls at play on the beach in, in Jersey. And other in, uh, residents have made it uh, around the world. This is the famous singer, Lily Langford, who was the, the queen of opera, toured all the world back in the uh, 1800s. And Victor Hugo also lived on Guernsey. He was in exile for one of his books that was banned, and he ended up settling in Victor Hugo, uh, in, in the islands. The government of these islands, though, is a, is a medieval form of democracy. They call it a bailiwick, where they have a direct election of a what they call the constable that is in charge of the government. But then they pre uh, pledge allegiance to the royal family of England. And so they have a bit of pomp and circumstance when the new governor general comes appointed from London. Uh, and so this is the uh, proud, uh, let's say, British heritage that the islands have. Uh, now. Uh, <clears throat> but it's a small place, mostly known for offshore banking and tax relief. Now, uh, uh, by uh, curiosity, I ended up being the captain of a volunteer association that salvaged and raised this boat from the Connecticut River, where it sunk. And it turned out to be from, actually, Falmouth, England. But it was a ferry boat that was stationed in Jersey to sail people from Saint Malo, Jersey, to Plymouth. And it would take 10-hour... Uh, sails across, pounding in the uh, rough seas often. And it is now 91 years old, but it's fit and uh, out sail. I was just on it the other day. And uh, so it's a historic boat that's one of the little ships because it evacuated British troops from the Western Channel during December 1940. It was not a Dunkirk, but they had a whole other operation on this side of the English Channel. So it's actually a, a, um, a has a Royal Navy World War II veterans pennant that's hanging in Saint Helier, and I asked them if they'd send it to us. Said, "Oh no, you have to come and get it." So we're still planning to sail it across the Atlantic any long weekend of calm weather. Meanwhile, this is an, off of Connecticut uh, a little while ago, and so it's actually up in function. It's, the surveyor said this boat was built so tough for the English Channel that it could go on another 50 years by his estimation. And that's my son and his friend working on it. Now you don't have to do this on your cruise, but if if you want to raise sails, you can come and join us uh, any time you like. Now, next we're going to Samalo. Um, <clears throat> and this is their flag. This is a fortified city that was an independent republic uh, down on the, again, around from the south of the Channel Islands. And for some reason it has this, I think it's an ermine as its symbol. But um, the name Samalo. Uh, is actually Celtic, and they call themselves the Malouin, is the name of the people from Saint Malo. And uh, they were independent from France and England for centuries uh, because they had a tremendous fort that they built on the uh, banks of the Ranche River. And they defended themselves many, many times against the predations of Paris or the, the British. But it was most famous for having uh, the largest fleet of pirates in the whole region. And so there were constant battles between the authorities and the pirates. Uh, but the Malouins, again, were sailors, and they traveled all, all over the world. For instance, they were the first settlers in the Falkland Islands. And the Spanish name Las Malvinas actually refers to the Ma Malouins who came from Saint-Malo to establish the first port and fishing in uh, the Falkland Islands. Um, but this is what it looks like today. Now, the, this city was badly bombed in World War II. They spent 12 years rebuilding it to its previous state. Now it's, it's an island essentially that the, because of the very big tides means uh, you can get into it uh, at certain times but other times the low tide you can't get near it. So that's why it was a uh, preferred home for pirates. But now it's um, uh, in uh, it's sort of medieval, late medieval splendor and then uh, quite a bit of history, the, the great church in the center and uh, it's much bigger than the, of course the other towns in the Channel Islands and we won't see any other large city uh, till we get down to Bordeaux after this. But this is a, uh, a special place, particularly for the sailing tradition. Uh, Jacques Cartier was born there, the great French explorer who sailed out of Saint-Malo and, and he went to Newfoundland, which was known, but then he went up the river, which became the St. Lawrence River. And this is a, a French illustration of the period when they found in New France. Uh, which they also call Canada, which is a Huron word for the banks of the river, the St. Lawrence. But Cartier is still very famous in Saint-Malo as one of their great uh, explorers. 
and they have very close relations with Quebec, of course. Uh, this is the uh, Hotel de Ville, which is the uh, mayor's office, the government center. Again, a medieval building and a fortif fortified uh, stronghold is uh, typical of this, all these towns along the coast. The cathedral with the beautiful rose window and views out to sea. Uh, so it's a very um, compact town, um, but then it's surrounded by the big ocean, so you have a feeling of great space. This is the tomb near Saint-Malo outside of uh, Chateaubriand, who was the great French chef, and of which the dish is named after him. And there are little fortresses like this further out. Uh, it's very rocky close and very difficult to get around unless you um, watch the tide and get in. Of course, we will. Um, but you can see the expanse of the ebb tide. This whole area in France is uh, uh, say, very rocky and very... Um, uh, difficult to get around, especially in a small craft. This is the symbol of the region, which is looks like salmon, but I think they're actually cod. That was the great catch up here. And if you know uh, what we call chowder, that's actually uh, a local dish here on the north coast of France, uh, which was essentially the leftovers from the fish. You just throw all the bones and everything in, and they call they called it a chaudrier, which means the the big pot. So it would uh, cook up things. So we still use the same local word into English called chowder. Now here's the, the great goal of our visit to Saint-Malo, which is the Mont Saint-Michel, Saint the, the sort of fortified church as it is out there in the mud flats. And this was originally again a, 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 a Celtic, then a Roman, and then a medieval, and then this is the Gothic period where they built it up even more. So it's quite fantastic because it floats in this shallow sea and then when the tide is out you could walk there. Now they have a causeway so people can get there at any time. But otherwise, again, because of the tide it was impregnable. It was attacked and traded and you know, long history of uh, trouble but also defense. So this was a, an active church with monasteries but you can see the, uh, the fortifications around it. So this is a great thing to go see if you haven't been there. Um, of course, there are a lot of other medieval churches around the area, but none, none quite in this spectacular setting. Now, the building itself is a classic nave and apse, uh, great church, and then you can see the little villages and the, the walls around it. So this has been developed over a century or two. A little bit left of the armaments that were there, of course, now it has no military function, but uh, it was uh, one of the strongholds for this whole region, particularly Saint-Malo region, to defend themselves against uh, outsiders. But if you've ever been to Quebec, uh, the old city, it looks just like this. And so little lanes and now little shops and a few, not that many people live there, maybe a thousand in the winter, but it's a great site in the good weather to go see its inner cloisters. And then this uh, is right up in the top of the church and then above it is the great spire with the archangel on the top. It's sort of late French Gothic style. It was built in the uh, mid-1700s. Well, I left out that other town. I think it's called Paris. And, of course, Paris is so well-known and well-visited, and there's so much in it, I'm going to be very brief about it, because I'm here mainly to introduce these other places you probably haven't been. But uh, you know that it is a, uh, first of all, vast city of maybe 10 million now, with the core of the city on the Ile de Cité, that where the fort fortifications were in medieval times. And then uh, all the city walls and all that have now been turned into the great boulevards. And through the tumultuous history of France, and particularly Paris, it's spread out into all these other areas with the Bois de Boulogne and the other sites. Uh, they're too, too numerous to mention, really. And uh, uh, those of you who are going to France, I mean, just one day or two days in, in Paris, I mean, it, it's just never enough. And the more you go, the more you realize it's both a beautiful city, but very, very interesting in all of its different parts. And not just the old history, but some of the new constructions and the, the new neighborhoods. Um, so it goes on and on and on. Uh, the, um, a lot of the, the, the new buildings are outside. They built a big office area called La, La Défense. And there's, like in London, suddenly they're popping up skyscrapers, but not in the historic core of the city, fortunately. Uh, but this is the one skyscraper that uh, somehow got built over the objections of many Parisians because they thought this thing was just an abomination when in the 1880s uh, the, uh, the great engineer uh, Eiffel, Gustave Eiffel, proposed it as a symbol for the city to 
you know, show the modernization and the engineering capabilities of, of France. And so uh, it was roundly debated because they thought it could not be built. And here he had this uh, design um, with the possibility of some other things around it. But uh, just the structural engineering of this is, uh, was a great innovation because there had never been steel or rather uh, wrought iron construction done like this where you had a sweeping great beams and cross ties to be able to build such a big tower. So here's the construction of it with the, the footings on the sides. And, it, and it, now it makes perfect sense because you have four legs and it goes up and it's now it's um, certainly a landmark of engineering but uh, m much stranger things are being built these days. So here it goes up in the, the neighborhood. They cleared out a whole neighborhood just to build it. Now, of course, it's uh, the center of town near the Champs Elysees. And um, but the uh, just the amount of steel and, and construction material that went in it was unprecedented at the time. And, and as a, as a sailor, uh, it, it's also related to shipbuilding. That's where the technologies crossed over. So you could you could curve and then build onto a structure that's as strong. Um, and it, at first, they really didn't know whether it would stand up. But of course, it has, and it's become the symbol of the city. This was the way you got up when it was first built, these sort of big boxy elevators. Now they have high-speed elevators to go up. I don't think you can walk up it at all. Uh, but when it was open, then it became the, uh, the, the great lit symbol of the great city of light. And this was just when elect electrification came in. So this was the most modern and beautiful thing built in its era. And it is to this day. But it, you go in the, the old medieval streets, you think, where did this thing come from? It's quite fantastic. Uh, like a spaceship landed on the city. And of course now it is the symbol of Paris in many ways. World War II, it was not damaged, fortunately. Like the whole city was saved. Um, this is a little earlier when it was at the center of the great uh, uh, exposition, 1889. And uh, that was a pavilion with kind of glass uh, exhibition halls that had now been turned into the gardens around the area. And if you go, if you haven't been, or if you go again, uh, there's endless sort of detail that you can see on this panel, which is above the main uh, structure on the ground, are all the names of the engineers who worked on it. So it's you know, a great triumph of its era that remains. But now it is so busy, Paris is so filled with tourists that the Eiffel Tower, now that it has a high-speed elevator and it's been fixed up with restaurants and things, and uh, it uh, gets record um, uh, visitation over, I think it was about 8 million last year. So if you want to stand in line, uh, bring lunch. And this is the view from below if you don't want to go up it. But uh, it's uh, still a remarkable structure. This just shows how, m how many people come to it nowadays. So that it is even imitated in other uh, upstart towns like Las Vegas. But I'll, I'll just leave you with uh, the last view. And the, at night, it lights up, and uh, you can get a view of the whole city. And then there's a restaurant at the top called the Altitude. So uh, better, uh, no, better known for its view than its cuisine, but it is a classical French restaurant. And at night, of course, they will uh, light it up, and it's the center of celebrations, for, particularly for Bastille Day. Um, and um, with that, I'm just going to say bienvenue à la France. We'll have, I'll be giving two more talks about uh, Bordeaux and uh, the region of where we're going next, and then also about Portugal uh, in a number of days. But I would enjoy the opportunity to talk to you pr personally and have a drink and get to know you while we're on board for this great trip through beautiful France and beyond. But thank you very much. My pleasure to be here.